All right. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to the secret to classroom engagement. Everyone has a voice. Um, so one thing we want our graduate to be able to do um, is to communicate well and to learn to communicate well in addition to interacting with the content material, students need to interact with one another and with the instructor. Studies show that instructional approaches that use student interaction are most likely to enhance student learning in a diverse classroom. I know faculty, myself included, use many instructional approaches to encourage student participation and interaction through discussion, Q&A session, presentation, writing, and problem solving. So today, we will explore together some evidence-based strategy that support equitable classroom participation and engagement. And I will put together the um, different references, additional resources for this presentation uh, in a reference slide at the end of the presentation for you. And I will send all attendees a copy of the slide after the workshop. So let me check the waiting room one more time to see if we have anybody else waiting. All right. And then we can jump right back in. So my name is Lin Wen. My pronouns are she, her. I have taught chemistry at NIU since 2016 at both the undergraduate and graduate level. And last year I joined the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning as an inclusive teaching coordinator. So although I'm very new to the professional development um, I have over a decade of teaching experience in higher education here at NIU and at various private and public institution. And I'm super excited to have you here with me to discuss fostering equitable classroom engagement and communication skill for our students and better prepare them for a diverse workplace. So thank you so much for being here with me. So um, now, in the chat, or you could unmute yourself. I would like for us to spend a few minutes um, and find out how diverse we are in terms of our disciplines and expertise. So please tell us uh, what is your discipline? And the second thing I would like for you to consider sharing is what you hope to get out of this workshop. So mm -hmm. feel free to unmute and introduce yourself, or you can type in the chat. I think I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment so that we can see each other. Let's see. Brendan, special and early education. Always looking to improve online teaching for graduate students. Michelle Wright uh, from psychology. Been here since 2023. Welcome. You're still really new. Hope to learn more about increasing classroom engagement, especially in the more difficult class like advanced research method. Dr. Janelle um, from Black Study, from the Center for Black Studies. Bonnie, sociology. It's always the same handful of students participating. <laughs> See, love to encourage others to lean on those who always answer or ask questions. Oh, okay. So Samantha from Child Protection Training Academy, teaching new child abuse investigator. I see. Bill from Music. Julie. Julie. I see, did I miss you? College education, I see. So this is super exciting for me. We have a very diverse group of people here from different disciplines. Well, stop my video. 
for just a moment. It's distracting. <laughs> I, I'm super excited to see we have faculty from diverse field here, and I would love for you all to, I love for everybody to share how has your experience been with um, student participation in class and um, as well your way of engaged student. I hope I look forward to a very engaging conversation from all of us. All right. So um, I set out a few learning objectives for us to discuss today. Um, a truly balanced class engagement strategy promotes equity and inclusion, um, often by amplifying the voices of all students rather than just a handful outspoken few like one of you did mention. So of course that doesn't happen by chance. It's gonna take work. It's gonna take intention and preparation to cultivate equitable interaction that can promote active learning. So the goal for our workshop today is for you to be able to do um, these four things. One, develop norms or guidelines for participation in your class. Um, the second one is to construct equ equitable ways to call on your student. And this gonna be, it's gonna vary, depend on your class size and, and the different, um, way that you teach, whether you teach online or in-person or hybrid classroom. Um, number three, nurture voices that were historically silenced in higher education. And number four is how we can equitably assess student participation or engagement, or do we grade student engagement? Do we grade student participation? And if you do, how do you grade it? Mm. So um, here at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning, equitable grading is one of the core workshops that we offer. So if you're interested in learning more about different ways that we can equitably grade students, uh, please keep a lookout for the upcoming workshop from SIDOL. So first learning objective, develop norm for participation. So it, um, if you considered this, I really hope that you would consider co-generate your class guideline with your student. Um, this allows students to take part in establishing the type of classroom environment that they wish to see. And also it's gonna make it easier for you as a professor to reinforce the norm and remind student that, hey, you helped me create it this guideline, you agree to these to our classroom policy, so you need to um, keep your word, right? So a few basic norm are uh, depend on your course that you teach. What consider norm can be relatively different. For example, I see that Dr. Um, Junelle Bennett's in the room, and I, I wonder if when you teach a uh, course that on social justice education, for example, um, you might want to consider challenging some of the common guidelines for discussion norm, because many of those established guidelines reinforce the unequal power dynamic in higher education and in our society. So um, it, it really depends on what courses you teach. And I wonder if, um, if Dr. But Ed, if you don't mind, like if you could unmute yourself and share with our group, what's it look like for you? Because we have a set of ca class guideline, but then how would it look like in a social justice classroom? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. For my classroom, I tell our, all of our students that we are going through an experiential learning process. So that means that everyone is learning together. And so every voice in the room has to matter. And no question is going to be, you know, deemed as ignorant or, you know, not thoughtful or, oh, you should know that because we really want to learn from each other's learning experiences, their cultural background, their family upbringing in order to help cultivate new ideas of what we think about culture to be. So for my class, I know I definitely set the foundational guidelines that 
we are all learning. We're all asking questions. And it's important that you speak up regardless of your culture or identity or, you know, how much knowledge you have about the subject, because that's how we're going to learn through each other. Thank you so much for sharing that. I get back here. Um, and I guess I shouldn't be surprised. So I, I teach chemistry. It's considered hard science. And we share some of the uh, guidelines that you just mentioned about um, about encouraging everybody to, to participate and, and speak up. So um, in my classroom, our content chemistry is driven by evidence-based knowledge. So one of the norms that I work really hard to establish in my classroom is to normalize being wrong. I keep telling my student it's okay to make mistake. Is it normal to make mistake? This is how we learn. And so at the beginning of each class, after I introduce the learning objective for the day, I often ask question to evaluate the student prior knowledge of the, the learning objective. And if um, one or more of the students give me a wrong response, we actually have a little celebration. I would say something like, Excellent. That's what I thought 20 years ago when I first attended the general chemistry class. And and I say, great, we're going to learn something new today. Um, and I always emphasize to them that if you already know the answer to all the questions, what are you doing here? You should be in the upper division class. So I make it very normal for students to, to give wrong answer um, and or make a, a mistake. Um, and, and I would encourage you to extend that same idea when it comes to homework. Uh, I give my students a limited attempt on their homework so that they can correct the initial response and learn from their mistake. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and then the other thing I want you to consider is to acknowledge and appreciate the effort of those who are participating, because it takes bravery for one to raise their hand, to ask for clarification or answer a question about a complex concept um, in the classroom, in chemistry classroom, it would be like structure of an atom is hard to understand. It's so abstract. Um, so as an instructor, I always acknowledge and thank students who ask questions for clarification, explanation, and um, more or, or question of more example on how to solve an analytical problem. Um, and I've taught large enrollment classes up to two, 200 students per section, Chem 110. So it's very critical for me to establish um, some other expectations. So I encourage you to have established expectation for being on time, um, how you would like them to use or not use technology in your classroom, and um, whether you allow them to hold side conversation or, or not. And um, I encourage you to establish all these rules at the beginning of the semester and work with your student um, on establishing these norms. And, and share the norms and your rationale for the norms on the first day of class and continue to talk about these throughout the first week of class. Uh, in some classes, like the general chemistry lab, we actually have students sign a code of conduct because we safety in the lab is very important. <clears throat> so we have students agree and sign um, a, a code of conduct for, for the lab that they will be participating um, so that we can hold them accountable. Um, and first and foremost, we want to protect them and keep them safe. So um, in this section, I budget a few minutes for discussion because I would love for everybody to hear from one another about your ex experience as well, your perspective um, in your course. What are some basic norms that you use in your class? And um, the second question is, do your classroom norm challenge the dominant narrative? And um, what's Leave the slide up for just a few minutes so you can take a look at that. So um, some of the thing that the second question might bring is our student 
racial and gender and social identities can influence uh, the extent to which they participate in class, right? So how do we create a space that we can encourage the introvert, the quiet one, as well as the, the fast talker extrovert to both um, participate to some extent? Um, so how do we create a brave, not safe, not just safe, but brave, an open environment to have um, conversation uh, that are essential for growth and for academic success. So I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second. And once again, um, we can participate by uh, unmute yourself or you like to type, you can type it in the chat. Um, let's see. Julie, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So I teach, one of the classes that I teach regularly is, is classroom management, okay. um, which is the classroom learning environment. And it's comprised of students who are going to become teachers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a great class because you have to model for them exactly how you want them to teach their future students. So when we, I'll just back up a tiny bit and kind of connect it to what we've already talked about. So the first day, I don't go over the syllabus. We don't do anything like that. We just spend the time, um, just, you know, a very quick overview. And I tell them, I want them to walk out on day one, feeling comfortable and having a good idea of, of and what the class is about. Um, but we spend a lot of time, they make their expectations for me. Mm -hmm. And then I tell them my expectations. Um, one of the things I do ahead of time is a student inventory where they all answer the same set of questions, but then there's a spot where they can share anything personal with me, um, any concerns, anything they think I need to know to be the best teacher I can be for them. And sometimes they'll say, um, participating is really hard for me. I'm really shy in the classroom. Or they'll talk about having anxiety um, in the classroom. I ask them if they consider themselves an introvert or extrovert when they're in the classroom. And then um, I create the groups so that they don't have that anxiety about who am I gonna work with. And that very first day that we do classroom expectations, I just have them either in a pair share that I've deliberately made or a very small group that I've deliberately made um, so that I'm sure we have some diversity, You know, maybe a student who feels comfortable carrying conversation and a student who doesn't want to just yet. <laughs> have to carry conversation on day one. Um, and then they, I, I find that students sometimes have a hard time making expectations for us because they feel um, almost like it would be disrespectful to say, well, I don't want you to do this or you need to do this. So what I tell them is to start with what has been problematic for them in the past mm -hmm. in classrooms, for example, um, have you ever felt disrespected by a professor or in the or in the classroom by another student? Or um, have you have you struggled with professors who don't enter grades on time, whatever? And then once I give them some of those examples, then they get to work. <laughs> and then I give them a little time and then we come back together and we make a big anchor chart together and we kind of talk through and negotiate what exactly do they mean? What does that look like when you say be respectful? What does that look like? What does that sound like? Um, so anyway, I could go on, but that's just oh. kind of an idea of how I, um, yeah. how I, 
put them in groups um, with with a little diversity, but kind of ease into the participation. Um, I find that sometimes students are just more comfortable doing a pair share with the neighbor next door instead of raising their hand in front of the whole class. It's just kind of a, a first step in. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I like it's sounded like your class is a wonderful place to be. I want to be in your class. Oh. Um, <laughs> and, no, well, and it's really it's just it, I, I think a lot of it is it, is just about trust. Yeah. And that takes time. You know, they need to see like their future students need to see I'm not going to let you fall. You know, I can tell them mistakes are welcome. I want you to make mistakes. I want you to ask questions. This is this is a safe space. But not everyone will believe that, you know, talk is cheap sometimes. And sometimes they just, they need to experience that no matter what they ask, no matter what they say, it's going to be honored. They're not going to feel disrespected or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so glad like you so brave to ask student for expectation of you. I don't think I, like throughout my um, undergraduate and graduate career which is like 20 years ago I don't think any of my professor asked me that so thank you for your innovative um, classroom uh, guideline let's see we have in the chat Brandon wrote um, I use a method called enter teach I only have several students who are not as comfortable participating in larger group discussion, but when they are in a group of three or four students, they are more likely to discuss course material. I am able to walk around a joint breakout room, hear those quieter students engaged in smaller setting, as well as interact with them in this manner. I were one of the quieter students. Like you can count on me not to raise my hand to speak in front of the whole class, but put me in a group of three or four, I will talk. So <laughs> Brandon, what's you? Yes, so I'm so glad that you did that for your student. Bonnie say, yes, Brandon, I do this as well, especially when I we get to sensitive topic. I have had student report that they feel judged in the whole group setting at time if their opinion differs from other. So yes, um, inter-teach. I have no idea that that's technique or method have a name. So now I learned something new today too, inter-teach. That's a really good name. Thank you so much for everyone for sharing. So you're gonna see many of these things that you say here. You're gonna see, I repeat it in the presentation, just so you know that you've been doing a fantastic job using um, the evidence-based techniques that that studies show help students with equitable participation. So thank you for that. So now let's get back to our learning objective here. So um, the, all the information that you share by speaking and typing in a chat are very valuable. Um, here's uh, some other thing that you probably already consider, but I want to throw out here for you to, to once again see it. Um, some strategies for having a successful small group discussion or for the whole class equitable student participation. Um, invite students to think about the way they participate or talk during class discussion and make a conscious effort to be mindful of other. So for example, um, if an individual usually talk, perhaps invite them to take a step back and do more of the listen. Um, so that's what I have in think versus talk, talk. cause you sometimes would have students who, um, the tendency you just, they, they love to share. So they have something to share that would just, um, jump in and, and have the tendency to, to speak. But then you also have the quieter thinker who, um, probably would not speak unless you like invite them directly. So this is just um, something to consider. Also consider your multi, a multilingual uh, learner of English. Um, so I don't, I'm retraining myself to call English a second language with the new term that I learned recently and it's multilingual 
learner of English because we want to emphasize on the fact that they know multiple languages. So I'm one of those ESL student and I did not participate in class not because I didn't know the answer to that math question or to that chemistry question but because I were too concerned with my accent when I speak English so sometimes I know the answer I want to discuss something but I would not raise my hand and speak in front of the whole class because of my um, accent so that's something for you to consider um, when you have a quieter student in your class as well. So um, the second thing I want you to um, consider is the, the difference between equal and e equitable, right? Um, beware of how gender, cultural, background, social, economic status, a different life experience could uh, affect the classmate um, interaction. So I encourage students to assume that their classmates um, come from different experience, have different background, have different, um, just we're just different individual. So we unique individual with unique experiences. Um, so uh, all that could affect the way we participate or, or not participate. And then the last thing I want to just help the student distinguish is the difference between intent and impact. Um, so encourage students to assume that their classmates are doing the best and want everybody in a class to succeed. However, um, students must acknowledge the negative impact of their words and behavior, um, and that can have an effect on the class participation. And as professor, you need to address those behaviors as they arise. So uh, the second thing that I want us to spend some time on is uh, how do you construct equitable ways to call on students, right? So that we can avoid the situation. We only have a handful of students only participate and speak up and other don't. So is it essential for you as a professor to manage who is speaking when and who is taking turn? We don't want a few loudest or most confident voices to continue to choose when they speak and inadvertently silent the quiet voices. But at the same time, we want to be mindful and not silent the one who are engaged and passionate about um, a topic, um, for example, social justice. So what do you consider when you're constructing practical and equitable way to call on your student? Um, do you consider cool calls? I teach large enrollment class, so I often have to resort to you cool calling. Um, it can be effective to encourage participation from less vocal students. It can also be an excellent way to bring students who otherwise wouldn't volunteer into the discussion. But I think it's helped to establish that you're going to do this in the beginning of the semester. So I always warn my students that I would use cold calling and I would walk up and down the big lecture hall in Fairday 143 so they know that I'm going to be at every spot in the room. I have a little microphone that I carry with me so that everybody can hear me um, whether I'm in a left upper corner of the lecture hall or down up front. Um, so I warn them that I'm going to be everywhere walking around the lecture hall and they need to pay attention and they need to be prepared to be on the spot. So um, with all of that warning given, I'm always very intentional about making sure that I call on people in equitable ways. So I'm prepared to deal with the awkward silence. Um, that's, that's what I have here. Wait time. So I wait for a minute or two um, after asking the question. And one of the and it can be very challenging, like that awkward moment. Um, so one of the simple strategy that I use to increase time for students to think and to expand the number of students participating verbally um, is to 
to use this wait time. So an increase in time allows students to process um, the, the question and it's also allow the more introverted student time to, to rally the courage to volunteer and answer. So, um, so sometimes I even have to count like 1001, 1002 um, before acknowledging a potential student response. It's just kind of a way that helped me track the time after asking questions to give student think time. And sometimes wait time or think time may not be enough for some student to gather a thought or muster the confidence to share that thoughts. Many students need more uh, scaffolding, more instruction and guidance. Um, so one way that I do is to require students to write down one or two ideas that would capture their initial thought on how to answer the question. So this act of writing, it helped me when I was a student, and that's why I'm trying to use it to give my student a time to think about the question. And then I ask them, get out your pencil, get out your paper. I provide sketch paper in my class as well. And I ask them to write out what you think, like give it a try. So this um, act of writing may even lead to student discovery, um, discover points, of confusion or key insight um, uh, on the topic being discussed. And um, it depends on how large is your classroom size. This writing can sometimes you can collect them and as can, you can use them to hold students accountable in thinking and recording their, their ideas. Um, one other thing I put here, I think Pesha and I think somebody mentioned it. Uh, if you could integrating one or more think Pesha opportunity during a class session, it's had a potential to cultivate classroom equity in multiple ways. One is providing individual student time to verbalize their thoughts about concept um, and promoting uh, compar uh, comparison of ideas among their classmates. Um, it's can also transforming the nature of your classroom environment to make it more partic participatory, promoting collaborative, um, and and uh, establishing a, a a more collaborative and less competitive culture in in your classroom. So. Um, Increasing wait time, allowing write time, utilizing think pair share, uh, all of those can also be very helpful in ensuring that you have an equitable distribution of call across gender, racial, um, different um, ident social identity. Um, if there's, let's see, um, I think the next few minutes. I want to hear from you, like what are the various ways that you use to encourage student participation in your class and how can you ensure that um, your class has an equ equitable way for every voice to be heard? So how do you call on your student? Which of these practices have you tried? Did it work in your class? Did it not work in your class? And let me see, once again, I'm going to leave these strategy right here so that you can review them as you think about these questions. If you use one or more of these strategy or what else have you tried? How did it work out? Please, Dr. Bennett. I agree with what you do in your classroom. I let students know in the beginning of the semester that I'm not picking on you, but I want to hear from you. And we have some students that talk more than others. And so I'm going to call on you because I think your perspective is important. And so whenever I do cold calls on students, I always say, okay, we really want to hear from you or, okay, I see that you it looks like your wheels are turning. You know, <laughs> do you have something you want to share? And then just kind of wait in that silence and then encourage them to say whatever's on their mind. Yeah. That's beautiful. I'm so glad. Do you mind sharing with us how large or small, what is your typical class size? So I have anywhere between 27 and 32 students. 
I see. Would you say, um, yeah, and I think the see, um, would they mostly, do you teach Black Studies, correct? Correct. Do you, do you, um, do you mind share with us the demographic of the students? Absolutely. It is super diverse. And it, I mean, diversity ranges beyond just, you know, the age or gender, or excuse me, the race or gender. I have a lot of different students from different ages, which is super helpful for my class because a lot of the historical contexts that we talk about, some of the older students, the more non-traditional students are able to vouch because these things happen during their time and during their era. So I really appreciate the diversity of my class makeup because it gives a really true perspective. Yeah, I love that. Do you use technology in your class to call? So my class is primarily synchronously, um, online, synch online synchronous. And so I have to do some breakout groups every now and again. Um, every now and again, I'll say, hey, let's popcorn it over to someone to speak. But the technology that I use is primarily online for them. So I tell students, however you decide to show up to class to learn and engage, I have to accept that and I'm willing to accept that. So if you're at your chair or in the student center or laying in your bed, it doesn't bother me. As long as you're engaged, as long as you are you know, answering the questions, sometimes I'll do polls throughout the class. Sometimes I'll say, I'll ask someone to piggyback on someone else's idea. Um, but however they decide to show up and learn and engage, I'm just grateful for them to want to learn. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Sometimes um, I've got your classroom is smaller than the 200 student that I have, but sometimes I find cold calling, it's the only way to encourage it more voices to to speak up and when you create a safe place a, a positive learning environment um this can be a really productive thing anybody else would like to share so have you used right time think pair share wait time call call or have you used anything else Bonnie, you do not do cold calls. Um, I have so many students who approach me in the initial student inventory that they have anxiety around being called on, how to balance that desire for participation. So I think you you correct when you, um, I'm, I'm so glad you put that in the chat. So in the past, right, we have, or the traditional classroom engagement. And I went through this where when you being called on, you freak out because if you get it wrong, you're gonna be shamed, you're gonna be make you feel that you are stupid. And so there's so much anxiety that come with that. But if you are in a classroom where the professor like me was like, yeah, that's what I thought 20 years ago. I gave that exact same question to my professor when she asked me, and then you just kind of open up and uh, the, the learning environment become different. Like every time a student say something that that's what they're not supposed to know, that's why they're in your class to learn and you make it known that it's normal. There's so many people out there, me included, before I learned this lesson, that's what I thought too. So let's dive in together. So I think a lot of the anxiety come from the traditional classroom where, um, the 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 student who didn't know the answer will make you feel um that they not intelligent they they not smart for not knowing the question so I can understand that and it's uh, it's really hard to balance but uh, I'm I'm glad that you very attuned to your student need and if that's what they share with you that they don't like then I. I respect you if you don't use it um, because that's what your student need. Um, Julie say often students don't participate due to a prior experience. Yes, um, when they get to you, they already went through so many other teachers. Um, 
It's about how we respond to the wrong answer. Yes, absolutely. So thank you for sharing all of that. And I'm gonna move on to the number three uh, of our learning objectives. So how do you nurture voices that challenge the dominant narrative, right? So pay attention to, to um, whose voices are we hearing and whose voices aren't we hearing. And um, if you think that there might be some voices that we haven't heard from or perspective that we haven't heard from, then maybe prioritize making more time to allow space for those voices and those perspectives and provide whatever they need so that they can participate. So with that said, um, again, it's gonna depend on your subject and, and your your way, of, um, your, uh, you, whether you're teaching online or, or in person. But um, I think there is something that we could do together is how um, the way we look, the experience we have, um, the experience we have and the choices that, that we make shape us into who we are today as educators and lifelong learner. And so uh, who we are kind of influence the way we see our student, right? Especially the one who are different from us. And so the way we teach and the way we motivate and encourage our student to participate um, and, and learn, that's have to evolve as our student chain as well. So I don't know if you know, but our student that and I use are very diverse. So chance that the student that you teach are different than you are pretty high. So I hope you can consider different way you could elevate historically marginalized voices in higher education and in society and cultivate brace spaces in your classroom so that these historically marginalized voices can can feel like they, they can participate. The voice will be heard in this learning space. Um, so, I try to pay attention to how much space someone is taking during class. I'm also thinking about how much space that person take up at the institution and perhaps um, in the world. And I'm trying to get my students to think about that as well. So if, uh, for example, if I have a student who represent a very underrepresented group taking more air time because they are sharing their experience from that group, or they trying to raise up voices of that group, I would let that go on and um and 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 let the student have more space, even if it look unequal in the sense of equal time, but it equity. Um know your student individually if you can, um, so you can best meet the their participation need, like Julie shared early on. Um, you did the survey and you know your student really well and you know what they need and you do your best to meet their their need, including their need for participation, which is wonderful. But sometimes if you have 198 students, you may not be able to do that. Um, uh, another thing to consider is instead of penalizing students who disengage during class, perhaps uh, talk to them outside of class and find out what is preventing them from participating during class. Um, to get students to feel comfortable speaking in larger group, um, like some of you, like I think Brandon mentioned, you might choose to start the conversation in smaller group first to provide a safe environment for students to gain comfort and confidence uh, while they test out their ideas with their peer. And then small group discussion and small group activity can also encourage the, the introvert or quieter student to become more involved and multiple voices maybe empower. Um, be clear about the outcome you expect from small group work for the time frame allotted. Um, tell students upfront what you expect them to do within their group and where we where you pick up form and um, whether you're gonna bring everybody back to your larger group conversation or not. So these are some 
way or strategy that you could consider to um, nurture the voices that um, historically silent in higher education? So um, I'm going to give us another um, space to share. How do you nurture diverse voices in your classroom? Is this something that you consider? Is this something that you practice? Is this something new that you just learned today? And I want to establish that to see also a safe place and a brave space so you will not be judged so if you come to ball can you share with our group how you nurture diverse voices um, and voices that challenge the dominant narrative um, how do the strategy or practices that I mentioned or other that you use provide positive impact on women, underrepresented minority in terms of achievement and um, attitude. And I think I saw, Brandon, you are in early and special education. So early education, presumably like early childhood education. I wonder if you could speak, because um, that feel seem to be dominant by women. So in that space, then the minority or the underrepresented group would be men. And do you see how that affect men? And can you speak a little bit about how sure. to yeah, engage so I, that group? Yeah, I am. So I'm in special education primarily, um, more on the special ed, not early childhood side. Okay. Um, so in most of my undergraduate classes, I would say about 95% are female. Um, so I've got usually one or two students in my classes that are males. And you can definitely tell that they feel um, a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and so I, I try on, whenever I'm giving a lot of examples um, or things in class, I try to encourage those students to talk about, you know, how they might, you know, make connections with male students, um, how they might, um, you know, uh, I guess show their, uh, their identity in their classrooms, you know, um, because the, you know, the reality of it is, you know, there's not a whole lot of male teachers, but those male students that are going to be in their classroom someday, um, are going to, you know, like to see representation and, and that mm -hmm. kind of thing in, in their classrooms. And so I try to come up with a lot of examples and have them share their experiences when they're doing things like clinicals and, um, you know, shadowing teachers and things like that and, and try to uh, encourage those those relationships. Brandon, thank you so much for doing all of that. So I am a mother of a second grader going into third grader and um and uh, a four years old who she's going to turn five soon and going into kindergarten. And they both go to the Tri Development and Family Center at NIU. And when they have their first male Try get supervisor, they were so excited and we were so happy because we we want our children to uh be provided with care from a variety of different people, different racial, different gender, different ethnic group and background, different experiences. And I think we face an issue that um, early childhood education seemed to be a feminine feel or a soft feel. And it's like you mentioned, it discourages our um, a male student from entering that field. So whatever you can do to nurture and, and encourage and, and normalize that I think it would be good for a parent like me, it would be good for our children, and it would be good for society. So thank you for nurtures the voices. Uh, Bonnie put in here, I highlight diverse theorists and select reading by, written by diverse authors. Yes. Um, Adding those things in your curriculum is excellent point. Um, thank you for doing that. Yeah, I'm so glad Brandon, you joined us today to hear about that because historically um, higher education will not make for women, but then 
to this day, there's certain field in higher education, women um, have passed the point where we have to elbow ourselves in. Now we become the dominant in that field, like early childhood education. So um, now um, we, we have to take care of the other voices. So Julie say maybe do an exit ticket or reflection and ask them to answer something like, what is a different perspective or POV? you learn from today. Excellent. Yes, that's exit ticket. If you can do that, that'd be wonderful. Dr. Bennett say, I share a vulnerable story of my experience in higher education and promote diverse scholar. Thank you so much for doing that too. Um, I know it takes courage to do that. And I sometimes do that too. I feel like storytelling is a very impactful way um, to, to open up a, a brave space for other people to share and learn. So appreciate that you're doing that for your student. All right, so last but not least, let's talk a little bit about um, whether we should grade student participation. And if we do, how can we do it in an equitable way? So if you do grade student participation, it's important to be mindful of potential biases, right? Some students may find it difficult or even uncomfortable to maintain eye contact with you to speak up or um, take note during class. I know it sounds crazy, but when as a English, a second language learner or multilingual learner of English, when I take notes, I, I can't keep up because um, English is my second language. So if I just take note with paper and pen, I take terrible notes, but if the uh, professor allow me to take note on my smart devices or computer, then auto correct, auto feel, all of that helped me take much better notes. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Uh, there's a whole host of other reasons why students may or may not look engaged or may or may not participate during class. And if you use some of the technique we discussed today, uh, many studies show that those practices will definitely help with increasing student participation. Um, so um, sometimes I, I have professor who teach seminar class or discussion-based class when grading participation is unnecessary. Um, so in those cases, I hope um, you consider aligning your assessment of participation with the learning objective and grade by the learning objective. So this involves assessing whether the student acquire the course objective rather than assessing student compliance. Um, and be intentional, be intentional about your grading. Um, I tell my student why I want them to engage and participate in, in my class. I don't, gate, I, I don't grade participation in my class, but I explain to students why it's important for them to engage and participate. Um, so how actively engage with the course material through class participation can help them acquire and retain knowledge and skill that necessary for their career. And there's so many studies that show active learning um, helps students retain knowledge better. Um, so if you must Gray participation. Another thing to consider is can you make the participation gray a formative assessment or can you make it a part of a final paper or presentation? Can you employ other um, strategy like expand feedback um, rather than grading? Um, so effective communication, providing timely feedback that promotes growth and developing grading rubrics are some other ideas to consider when you develop your equ equitable grading practices for participation. And um, CIDL, Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning, we do offer separate workshop on equitable grading, um, on um, effective communication, how to develop grading rubric, and on uh, providing 
feedback that promote growth. So if it's something you're interested in learning more, please keep a lookout for our upcoming workshop from CIDL and, um, and you can sign up for those. So we are five minutes away from um, our end time at uh, three o'clock. And I want to pause um, and give you a few questions to reflect as you're leaving this workshop. So think about how would the below practices engage your student participation? These are the things that we discussed today, right? I want you to please read and reflect for yourself. So if you have something nearby that you want to take note on, you could do that. Um, what are some changes you like to make with your participation practices or policy? Um, yeah, so you might want to write down a few thoughts. I'm practicing what we just talked about today. So I will be quiet for the next few seconds and uh, practice wait time. And when you're done, if you want to share it, please feel free to um, type in the chat if there's something that you would go read more on, something that you would do differently, another workshop you're interested in signing up for. Bye, Michelle. Thank you. So I say one last thing and then um, we can um, end this workshop. I've taught many introductory level courses um, and they are large courses with my largest class have 198 students per section. It gave me the opportunity to interact with hundreds of students um, every semester I taught. And I know our students are very diverse. Our students did not come with the same social capital or the same experiences. Um, they face different challenges. They have various development opportunity. Um, and they are re the result of diversity recruitment, which um, kudos to the recruitment office for doing the job exceptionally well. But um, when you look at our graduation rate, it's about 46%. And, and for white student, that rate is about 60%. For black student, that rate is about 30%. So anything that we could do to help narrow that equity gap and make higher education a more inclusive space um, that will make all of us make the world a better place, one successful student at a time. Um, so thank you so much for joining me today to learn more about equitable classroom engagement. Um, and I will stop sharing and stop recording.